um, so yeah, movement disorders, just doing a quick, when it wants to move, a quick recap of just some basics, because again, like if you've not done any neurology for quite a few years, I think the person or people that initially requested neurology were like, we haven't done it for years. We kind of want a bit of a clinically relevant neuroanatomy recap and then go into the stuff. So like I've built this in for the purposes of you guys, just to like trigger your memory, because sometimes it does still come up and it is relevant in like a locating the lesion sort of sense. Um, so just a quick reminder that your descending motor tracts are um, obviously going to be your pyramidal system, which is responsible for your voluntary movement through your cortical spinal and your cortical bulbar tracts, with your cortical spinal being your limbs and your trunk, and your cortical bulbar tract um, being your cranial nerves. Um, and then you've got your extra pyramidal tracts, which are what we're focusing on today. All of those that are coming from, um, from the brain stem, particularly from the raised ganglia, um, and they're responsible for involuntary movements or autonomic movements. Um, and I've gone into more detail on the slides and again in the handout on like what the different tracks do, but I'm not going to give it time here because it's not particularly important, um, like in the bigger clinical picture. Um, and just another recap again of like lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron um, signs because stupidly they still come up. It's like an easy way to fail an exam question is to forget okay that's an upper motor neuron sign that's a low motor neuron sign therefore that must be motor neuron disease because it's a mixed presentation or that one must be ms because it's an upper motor neuron presentation um so yeah just reminding yourselves that like your lower motor neuron signs are those wasting and fasciculations they usually target specific muscles as opposed to like um a group of say like your extensors or your flexors just because this is all happening like kind of outside of the cns um, you tend to present with weakness, patients are going to be quite floppy and flaccid, and they'll have absent or reduced reflexes depending upon like the degree of or the like underlying pathology. And for upper motor neuron, you tend to prevent, present with this weakness, particularly of your arm extensors and your leg flexors, with this opposing spasticity in your arm flexors and leg extensors. So classically, this is like a stroke patient who's going to be walking along with their arm kind of like tucked up towards themselves, the leg really straight and then um, dragging out behind them. They get this hypotonia, which is velocity dependent. So that just means that the more, that the faster you move it, the more hypertonic they're gonna get. And we sent, like sometimes we'll describe this as class my spasticity. So that's just where the faster you go, like the more spastic um, they, uh, their limbs will become. Hyperreflexia, so like, any of the reflexes that you test will have um, exaggerated responses um, and you get that positive Babinski sign of where you run your finger or pen lid or whatever you're using along the sole of the foot and the, the toe is going to splay. Clonus of at least three beats um, and there will be muscle wasting just because obviously they're not able to use these muscles as much if they're affected in this way um, but it's not wasted due to lack of, um, lack of nervous supply. So yeah, just a quick recap for you there. And quickly onto um, just to cover sensory tracts. Obviously you've got your unconscious spinocerebellar tracts, which are taking information from the Golgi tendons and the muscle spindles in your muscles, telling your brain, okay, my arm's over there, my leg's over there. Um, and then you've got your conscious sensory ascending tracts, which are divided into two. So you've got your posterior or dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway, um, which is what we're using for fine touch and tactile sensation and proprioception um obviously conscious proprioception because the unconscious kind of like okay my arm is over here signals are coming from your spinocerebellar tracts um and then you've got your anterior lateral system which is for more of like your crude sensation so pressure pain and temperature um and again that's worth remembering if you're coming across questions that are asking you like where lesions are in the spinal cord i think i had a question that was like that in um, not finals, but in third year. So loads of us lost marks at the end because we were just like, okay, what's going on? But if you can pin it back to like, that tract is there. If I have a lesion in this part of the spine, um, this is what it's gonna look like. You can work it out. So yeah, if you wanna go back to those, they're in the, um, in the handout I've made for you and they'll be on the sides to watch back, but just wanted to include them for the sake of like having a bit of a complete picture. Um, yeah, so again, this kind of might be a bit more recappy stuff um, for the perspective of like 
oskies or just generally like seeing patients on the wards and things um or if you get a question that's like okay a patient is walking in this way what is the likely underlying pathology i wanted to break down some examples of walks um and what kind of what they look like and what's causing them um because unfortunately for you guys it isn't sounding like you've probably had much neurology experience outside of maybe like the stroke wards that you're going to see in hospitals so if all the uh chance you ever get at seeing them is a few videos and like it's better than nothing so let's have a look so your first gait you tend to see with particularly like stroke patients maybe ms patients anyone that's having um some kind of upper motor neuron pathology is the underlying cause of their neurological condition might present with what we refer to as a spastic gait um so that's your patient who like as we were describing when we went over spasticity just then they're going to have like a really like stiff and contracted upper limb an extended lower limb that they're going to have to circumduct and circumduction just describes where they're sort of like having to bring the leg around in a circle to get it to move um so it's going to be really like slow and difficult for them to get anywhere um if they're affected with hemiphoresis this will present in just one leg so like again a straight patient or if um, it affects them bilaterally, so let's say like a certain presentation of um, spastic type cerebral palsy, then they're going to present with what you call a scissoring steps. So that's where you see that circumduction happening, happening in both of the legs as opposed to just one of them. Um, stepping gait. So whenever you see questions that talk about foot drop, um, there's a little rule that you'll learn, I think, through past med where it says, okay, if they can like do this but not that it's l5 or if they can do the other one or not the other one then it's perineal nerve palsy but um again you'll learn that through like trial in the, the past questions but foot drop you can put down to weakness of distal muscles um perineal nerve palsy or l5 radiculopathy usually caused by like um a bit of discitis or something like that um and it looks like this very nice gif that i found here for you where your patient's sort of trying to walk. If you really look at it, they're quite normal on one leg, but on the other leg, um, they're lifting their foot up a lot higher. It sort of drags a bit. They step it down with a bit of a flex knee and it slaps the floor. Um, and they can't really heel walk on that foot because they just, they can't coordinate the, uh, the movements there. Waddling gait. Um, so if the last one we saw was to do with weakness, in our distal muscles this one is distal uh, weakness in your proximal muscles so you might get this with someone who's got polyomyositis or classically muscular dystrophy so you see it in duchenne muscular dystrophy with what you call gower's sign where you've got these young boys that because they've got really like wasted calf muscles um sorry not the calf muscles really wasted thighs um they struggle to like sit from a standing position uh, stand stand from a sitting position so they sort of like climb up themselves um and i'm not sure what the patient here who's demonstrating the model for us has probably a bit old to be having duchenne's um because that's got quite a, a young mortality um but he's sort of demonstrating how he's got really weak hips so he's kind of like throwing his legs about and it's just because the pelvis isn't supported very well so that leads to that sort of like pathognomonic waddle if you will and trend ellenberg gate now whoever trend ellenberg was he's got loads of things named after him um but it's basically just something that we see um when you've got weak hip muscles so this guy i think is a lecturer who's demonstrating with a little bit exaggeratedly looks kind of sassy what it's like to um be experiencing hip drop and it's just due to like it, it could be a muscular cause like due to the weakness of gluteus medius um, minimus or it could be a nerve cause if there's some kind of pathology with L5. Parkinsonian gait so yeah again Parkinson's is going to be like probably about 80 percent of what we're talking about today. Um, so with Parkinson's you get this like characteristic sort of really slow to initiate um, slow shuffly gait um where they're kind of shaking as they go um they're in this stooped posture um so when we talk about the gait you've got a couple words that describe it so fenestrations are like this sort of like involuntary hastening that you see um the guy demonstrating here 
and retropulsion is just this poor postural control. So you can see that it sort of looks as though he's like kind of about to fall over at any minute. An underlying cause of this is just defects in the basal ganglia or as we're going to see, like there's all kinds of things that can cause um, a Parkinson's picture. Um, but whatever it is, it will be affect the basal ganglia or some part of the dopamine pathway in one shape or form. And then cerebellar ataxia, yeah, you'll be glad to know that whoever was demonstrating the uh, Parkinson's walk clearly isn't affected by it because here he is perfectly demonstrating um, what you call the drunken sailor gate. Um, so they'll have been teaching you in clinical schools for years that you've got to think of this as someone who's drunk um, and just can't like walk in a straight line, can't coordinate themselves. They've got this broad base gate because they're just all over the place um, and they'll do whatever they can to hold their balance. Um, this won't be affected by whether their eyes are open or not because they can't compensate with that visual input. Um, it's usually caused by cerebellar lesions and because the cerebellar, the spinal cerebellar pathways at least tend to be ipsilateral, um, they will veer towards the side of that lesion. And if you've got a midline um, lesion in what's known as the vermis of the cerebellum, then it will cause truncal ataxia and instead of like the limbs being all over the place, like you can see here, it just tends to more be that they kind of fall all over the place. So it's usually that they fall backwards or sideways. And if they've got a lesion to any of the lateral hemispheres of the cerebellum, you get this limb ataxia, which is more like the picture that we're looking at here. Cool. And then last one. Um, again, this is like the only gift that I could find that demonstrated this. I don't think you're going to see patients that walk in quite that exaggerated way, but it just gives you a bit of an idea of it. Um, sensory ataxia tends to result in this stamping gait because it's not so much that the patients are throwing themselves about all over the place because they can't keep balance. They just have no idea where they're placing their feet. They've lost that, um, they've lost that input. So they're sort of like having to guess where they're placing their limbs in a way. Um, so they end up stamping about almost kind of like they're walking blindly somewhere. Tends to be caused by polyneuropathy, for instance, with like, um, uh, diabetic polyneuropathy or with um, dorsal colon medial lemniscal lesions um, causing that loss of proprioceptive feedback. Um, so yeah they tend to throw their feet about before they bring them down. Um, quite a slappy maneuver um, and they'll be Romberg sign positive because they're reliant on the visual input to know where they are placing their legs. The minute that they lose that they have no idea where they're placing their limbs and whereabouts they're stood. Okay so yeah. yeah, hopefully that was like just a quick recap for you. Um, again, I know it's stuff you've done before, but it's stuff that really like, it is, no, it's one of those things that I think you can't really dissect it from what you've learned in second year, third year, fourth year, because it's just like all kind of one part of one bigger picture. And um, it's kind of hard to see a lot of the cases of this stuff. So hopefully that was a little bit useful to you. Anybody? Um, oh, good question. I think it is um because they do a bit of that but in to my knowledge there's a few that are kind of like high stepping gait um i've seen sensory sensory ataxic gait referred to as stamping gait before um and i've used the words high stepping to describe it so i'd say yes but i can go double check that for you if that's useful yeah um yeah, so don't don't quote me on it, but it, it is the way you would probably describe it. Okay, yeah. So to move on to idiopathic Parkinson's, um, obviously like a very nasty disease, quite a high prevalence of it, um, and you are likely to at some point meet a patient who is going to have this. So this is why like there's all the weird like Parkinson's plus syndromes which you're going to gloss over a little bit, but this is worth paying a lot of attention to because it does come up a lot. Um, and in practice, you're going to like, you would definitely come across it, whether like on care of the elderly or um, in like a disability setting or something like that, care homes and stuff. So in idiopathic Parkinson's, we are, oh yeah, this is a little fun fact, by the way. Um, if anyone's ever been at Whiston and had the consultant that loves you to know about like who was like the person behind the name and stuff. Um, I just thought I'd throw in a little bit of a fun fact about who Parkinson was because we talk about him loads in neuro along with people like Sharko. Um, and he was just this neurologist in 1817 who first described Parkinson. So he described it as being this tremulous motion, less muscle power, 
um, propensity to bend the trunk forwards and they sort of passed my walk into a running pace. And if you think back to the video or the gift that we were looking at a while ago, that is a really good description of it. You've got patients that are like in the stooped posture and um, they've got this ongoing tremor with everything that they do. Um, and it's not so much that like they actually are weak or there are lesions causing the muscles to be weak. It's just that they can't coordinate the muscle movement. Um, so yeah, if we take a journey into the basal ganglia, like particularly focusing on the, if you can see the substantia nigra, if you can see my mouse there where I'm waving that, that's the area that we're particularly concerned with here. Again, through this in for a little bit of revision in case anyone's that interested in um, going through their uh, neurological, neuro their thin, clinically relevant neuroanatomy. Personally, I never remember it particularly well. Um, yeah, just to remind you like why you're getting these um, weaknesses, it's just because within the basal ganglia, um, particularly like in the dopamine circuit, you've got these two pathways that are necessary for coordinating movement. So your substantia nigra, we will well know, produces dopamine through the pars reticularis. That dopamine is then active in two pathways. Firstly, the indirect pathway, which by binding to dopamine 2 receptors, um, dopamine is able to stop the your muscles from causing like having these unwanted contractions um that are just involuntary and it's to stop that competing with your voluntary movement so they will be the kind of involuntary contractions that you're seeing when your patient is tremoring with parkinson's and the direct pathway is there to permit us to initiate movement and to execute movement as i am like again if the, if the webcam's working and you can actually see me um in the way like you know like just moving forwards normally so um you see this new parkinson's patients as that inability to um like that, those slow to start movements that they have um it's just due to the fact that the the direct pathway isn't being activated by that dopamine so yeah just a little bit of like the underlying pathology there of like why this picture is happening so in idiopathic Parkinson's, you've got this chronic progressive neurological disease, which is characterized by a rest and tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, so just slow movements and postural instability, um, which both covers like your stooped posture, as well as this tendency to have falls they have. So a lot of the time, like patients with Parkinson's, it's going to get picked upon as someone that all of a sudden starts being very slow. They've maybe had a growing tremor for quite a long time and they're going to start to present with lots of falls. So I presume you guys are still kind of having CCTs like we were doing. I don't remember if this was a third or a fourth year CCT, but falls in the elderly definitely like was a big one. So this is a, quite a bit of the spectrum of like something to consider if you've got an old person that's presenting with falls all of a sudden. It happens in about one in 200 people over 80. Um, obviously it's not limited to over 80 year olds it does tend to be in the older population but you can get like certain genetic types that might present early um, but the risk of it goes up as you get older um, the underlying cause of it is you get these things called Lewy body inclusions um, that go and plant themselves in the basal ganglia and it just causes death of your what you call your, your nigrostriatal cells and your dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra um, in particular the pars reticularis so they're just like the buzzwords to remember because very occasionally like they can come up in questions and stuff like that um again the picture to the right summarizes what your patient looks like with parkinson's quite nicely there um but i i don't know for me like i like to be watching videos and stuff to kind of see how that looks in motion but we'll be going through the symptoms in a second anyway cool so yeah some basics so yeah we think there might be a genetic component we don't really know we know that the rate of male to female the ratios are about one and a half male to one female so there's a slight male pungence for it we think that there might be some link between past head trauma and increased incidence of parkinson's we don't really know um because it's one of those diseases that like as we're getting an aging population um all of a sudden we're seeing it and we don't fully understand it. And obviously we can't take great histories from the patients that present with it because um, it tends to come with like increasing cognitive decline as, as they go along with it over the years. So you tend to find the patients who get it, they have this program lasting like around seven years where um, they'll start to get difficulty with their sleep, uh, might to get, start to get like autonomic dysfunction, such as like erectile dysfunction, constipation, urinary symptoms um symptoms of achesisia like restless legs um and like 
general mood changes and things like that so that's not to say that every old person that gets depressed is going to get parkinson's but generally like if you take a history from usually like a collateral history off uh son daughter carer whoever they will report that there's been a few years where they've noticed a bit of decline in the patient that's presented with this so um to investigate it as always you need to do history and examination in this case it's particularly going to be a collateral history because um often patients with this might present quite late because you get um carers relatives whoever just putting it down to being like somebody getting old until the specific symptoms start to present um and the specific way we have of investigating it um, is using what you call a DAT scan. So that's doing like single photon emission CT or a PET scan um, using like radio labeled, whatever radio label, I think it's iodine that they use um, to see like how active the dopamine transport, um, tran dopamine transporters are in the brain. Obviously, if they're quite underactive, you're thinking this could be a Parkinson's picture because there's been destruction of them by some underlying cause. And also you're going to confirm that it is idiopathic Parkinson's and not another cause by trial and dopaminergic medications such as levodopa. So if you can clinically demonstrate that they have the core symptoms, uh, it's usually like bradykinesia plus one or two of the other core symptoms like the tremor and the rigidity, um, and they demonstrate a response to levodopa, um, then we're pretty, pretty confident that we've got... Um, We've got idiopathic Parkinson's going on here, um, but don't rule out your other causes, particularly if it's not an older patient that's presenting with it, or there's additional symptoms such as like cerebellar signs um, and optic signs as well. Then we sort of start to think, okay, is this one of the Parkinson's plus syndromes instead? So yeah, I've just got a picture for you here of a DAT scan. Again, this isn't something personally that I've ever seen done in placement. I personally haven't ever come across many Parkinson's patients but um, just in case you want to know what it looked like um, and then thought I'd break down some of the symptoms for you here so um, when we talk about the rigidity there's two types that are quite um, quite characteristic in Parkinson's where firstly you've got this cogwheel rigidity which is just having the tremor superimposed over the rigidity um, and it sort of presents as like this kind of cranking of um, yeah, cranking is probably the best way of describing it of like when you're trying to passively, passively move the limbs and then lead pipe rigidity is just this like stiffness throughout and unlike spasticity, it's not velocity dependent. They will just remain, retain that rigidity like throughout the entirety of the passive movement. Um, we also talk about patients having what you call... ...kind of emotionless, like a, unfortunately like a bit of like a husk of a human being it's quite sad um something else that's unique ish to parkinson's is what you call micrographia so they have this really small handwriting and because what you tend to get with parkinson's is like their movements will decrease in amplitude as the movement is prolonged so like for instance like when they start walking somewhere they might start off quite quick and it'll get slower and slower and slower um, the same thing happens with the handwriting so they might start off quite strong and then it'll just trail off all of a sudden because it's like they sort of get this fatigue and just like it gets harder and harder for them to communicate uh, for them to execute the movements they're trying to execute and then when you um, talk about the tremor that you get in Parkinson's it's classically a resting tremor that's described as a pill rolling tremor so pill rolling is just referring to like the movements that they're doing which you can see assuming that the gifts are playing right for you guys yeah you can see it in the um, in the little video there. Um, I didn't mean to zoom in on that. There we go. So yeah, just to quickly go over some of those features again. Um, well, not to go over them again. Yeah, you'll get those features, and usually they are like one-sided. And with time, it might say start just with like the tremor in the hand, and it will generally like spread across that side, and then possibly like spread over to the other side. But it usually for a reason we don't quite know, usually has a preponderance for one side over the other. And some other features you can get are just like a general fatigue, constipation, um, dual and difficulty swallowing is quite common. So there's quite a high aspiration pneumonia risk in Parkinson's patients if they aren't cared for properly. Um, and it's not unlikely for them to become um, comorbid with depression and then dementia because this cognitive decline, um, either just because there is a link between the two or because um, you've got those Louis bodies, um, get into other areas of the brain as well um, there's quite a link a high link between dementia and like in the later stages of it um, and 
I talked about how falls can be an initial way of it presenting, but often it can also be that someone just notices that they're struggling to get up out of a chair or get up out of bed because they're struggling to like initiate their own movements. Um, yeah, so it is a sad condition. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to keep checking if any of you guys have any questions. Cool. Um, so yeah, luckily, at least for a while, we can medicate this. With like being a chronic condition and it being one that mostly affects the elderly, we don't have a cure for it. So your mainstay of treatment is going to be levodopa. Um, and you're going, you, you don't always give this straight away, but as soon as patients start to present with like motor symptoms that are really affecting them, you need to get them on it. And you need to make sure that you combine it with what you call a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. So like the main drug that we use for that um, is carbidopa. Um, you can also use one called benserazide if you want to, but you usually just see it down as carbidopa in questions. And this just reduces the peripheral like adverse effects that you can get um, and stops the, this um, artificial dopamine from being broken down in the peripheries before it can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, important to remember some of the adverse effects that you can get with levodopia. Levodopia. Levodopa. So you can get um, other dyskinesias. This thing called the on-off effect where it'll sort of like they'll be fine for a while and then it'll be almost like they're completely switched off. Um, they can get postural hypertension, arrhythmias, psychosis, um, and they can particularly get this like nausea and vomiting. Um, and you can treat the nausea and vomiting with domperidone, which is an anti that, yeah, even though it is a dopamine antagonist, it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's not going to become a drug that's going to aggregate the, um, the Parkinson's picture any more than it already is doing. Some other kinds of medication you can consider using, and usually you'll use these alongside levodopa. Like it's quite rare for you to take patients off the of levodopa. So you can sort of see an example packet of that up in the top right corner where you've got someone on carbidopa, levodopa, and entecapone, which is a Comte inhibitor. Um, so you can consider dopamine antagonists, um, we tend to use what you call non-ergoderivative dopamine antagonists um, because your ergo ones, which you used to use before them, cause fibrotic changes. So things like cardiac fibrosis. So um, the risks of them weren't really worth the effect. Um, you might use MAL-B inhibitors like selegiline, antimuscarinics to deal with your tremors, um, COMT inhibitors. And for really advanced patients, you might consider using apomorphine. So I think the main bits that I've always taken away from Parkinson's treatment have been your levodopa, carbidopa and apomorphine in extreme cases for like short symptomatic relief because as patients go on in the levodopa treatment at some point um, for whatever reason they get kind of resistant to levodopa and it stops working um, and apomorphine is just really good at like quickly relieving them from quite disabling symptoms and you can give it subcut either as like um, a quick pen like you sort of would an epi pen or you can have it in a driver and then something else that is used but it's reserved for say um quite extreme cases where people are healthy enough so usually like those under 70 um with quite disabling dyskinesias that aren't sorted out by the medication you can use deep brain stimulation so we use this for quite a few um conditions but parkinson's is probably one of the main ones so you insert electrodes into the brain usually going to be like uh, substantia nigra, globus pallidus, like the areas that are um, involved in um, those direct and indirect pathways. Um, and there is quite a high success rate with it. But obviously, like, it's just quite invasive and it's not ideal. Um, don't forget how important it is as well. Like, we talked about the medication, but these patients are going to need the multidisciplinary team. They're going to need speech um, therapy. Um, particularly if they're not that far on, they're going to need um, occupational therapy and for physiotherapy is all going to be really useful. Um, and it's important to remember as well, like you're not suddenly just going to withdraw any of these drugs because you've got a risk of akinesia and mal malignant neuroleptic syndrome as well, which if you've covered any psychiatry, like you'll read more about that when you do antipsychotics, which again can be done in another session at another time. Yeah. Quick, like, little breakup thing. Um, if you want to see what, um, if you want to know a little bit about the history of Parkinson's and, like, kind of understand this on off effect, would highly recommend watching Awakenings, which is based on the book by Oliver Sacks, where you get Robert De Niro basically. It's 
to nobody that anybody that hasn't watched it, it's sort of set around like um when levodopa was first proposed. I think it's like one of the first drug trials for levodopa or something like that. Um and the patients are like, this is amazing. Um, their lives have been restored, but then all of a sudden they start to become aware of the on-off effects and the fact that it's not a permanent solution. So yeah, quite a sad film, but actually like think of it as think of it as a revision break. Think of it as education. So yeah, follow up and prognosis. So these patients are going to be needed to seen by a neurologist, a movement specialist, um, movement disorder specialist, I should say, um, about every three, four months. They're going to need a lot of input from different groups. And within about two to three years, which is not really like a long time at all, you can expect that um, levodopa and whatever other agents they're on um, are going to start to wear off a bit. Um, so they, their symptoms start to come through again. They start to get this on-off effect um, and the level of disability that they're experiencing increases. With time, they experience more freezing, which is where your patients, they're not even like just shaking and um, struggling to um, move about. They're struggling to initiate any movement at all. They fall over a lot um, and the, the prevalence of dementia shoots up as well. And this progression is accelerated by having patients who are older at the age of onset, whether that's just because they've been caught further on in the first place or not. Um, patients who present with rigidity and hypokinesia as their presenting symptoms, say over Bradley kinesia or, um, or the tremor. Um, patients that don't show as good a response to dopaminergic agents like levodopa and those who have cognitive decline um or other like more abstract symptoms of parkinson's present at diagnosis so yeah there's a nice and literally until maybe like a couple of days ago i'd never seen this before but um you can break the stages of parkinson's down into five stages if you really want to which we've kind of covered where you'll have like the minimal symptoms might not really notice it starts to affect the whole body a little bit more then the balance and coordination start to go um, and then they slowly become like more and more bad bound, more and more like um, reliant on other people. Um, yeah, this is kind of like information that's is, is generally like a, a very like good way to break the information down about what's going to happen to patients that are um, maybe in like stage one or two of the journey. Um, obviously, like still like really not a nice thing to read, but it explains like um, the sort of timeline of it quite well. So yeah, onto the Parkinson's plus syndromes, which I always think like the likelihood of you ever actually seeing these just in a hospital, not very likely, but they still kind of love them in exam questions because they're just a little bit weird and wonderful. So they're worth knowing. Um, so we've got three of these. Um, obviously, like there's loads of other causes of Parkinsonism as well, which we'll have a little bit of a brief look at, some of which is in the handout um, because you'll cover it in other things and I'm not going to like make you stay here forever to talk about it um but yeah your Parkinson plus syndromes you're definitely obviously not going to cover anywhere else so first one is progressive supranuclear palsy name makes it quite easy to remember the key features about it so it obviously presents with the symptoms of Parkinsonism with your like key feature being this postural instability um and quite early on they're presenting with falls um you tend to find that the trunk is a lot more rigid than the limbs um, and they've got what you call vertical supranuclear gaze palsy. They're going to have difficulty looking up. Um, they might ha also have um, some other um, like cranial nerve palsies like pseudobulbar palsy, um, issues with the speech and swallowing and cognitive decline um, such as dementia is also quite common with this. So like I said, yeah, it's characterised by these visual problems such as looking up making vertical saccades, so that's like those upward eye strokes um, and converging, so bringing the eyes together to like focus on something that's just in front of them. And then um, the sort of characteristic face of this, which I suppose you sort of just get when you're looking kind of annoyed anyway, is what you call precarious or precarious sign. So that's the picture that's in grey at the bottom right there. So you have this like wide-eyed stare, furrowed brow and deepening of facial creases. Um, the underlying cause of this is to do with tau protein. Um, in the basal ganglia, not so much with, with Lewy bodies, or at least like that's what we believe it to be. Um, another name for this that you might sometimes see is in the picture just up in the top right here, which is Steele Richardson Olszewski syndrome. Might have said that wrong. Um, probably like worth just making a mental note of just because sometimes people love to call things by stupid names that <laughs> you haven't got like 
in your notes for some reason, but yeah, that's like the classical name of it. Okay, so second one is multiple system atrophy. Um, not to be confused with stuff like multiple organ failure or whatever. Um, I think I use the word multiple system atrophy and not necessarily apply it to neurology, but it's another one of your Parkinson plus syndromes, which um, is characterized by autonomic and cerebellar symptoms. And it's usually a case that like one or the other is more obvious. So obviously if it's cerebellar symptoms, it's gonna be things like that cerebellar ataxia. Um, if it's autonomic symptoms, it's gonna be things like bladder, atony, um, constipation, um, erectile dysfunction, postural hypertension and stuff like that. Um, and quite an early, a common uh, early presentation of this can be vocal cord palsy. Um, and this again is due to alpha cyanucleic inclusions. The other like fancy name for well, a type of this is shy Draga syndrome, which you can see like, if you look in the sort of little um, cheat way of remembering the, the symptoms of an image I've got over there, like it's in the last little bit there for you. Um, again, like I'm saying like, okay, this is a really common presentation of, you know, vocal cords is gonna be a common presentation of it, but it's sadly like, it's not that common a thing, but yeah, still worth remembering that this is the one with like autonomic and cerebellar symptoms. If you're gonna remember, if you're gonna remember any detail about this. And finally out of the three is corticobasal degeneration. So this just quite literally is where you get degeneration of both your basal ganglia and your cortex. Um, which you can kind of see in the image just to the right there, like that's quite a drastic image. Um, so that presents with this thing called alien limb phenomena, where the patient literally will have a limb that just has a mind of its own. Um, myoclonus, so you know myoclonus to be um, like those sort of like electric shock like jerks that you like, we have them normally when we're falling asleep sometimes. Um, and higher order dysfunction, so they might have some kind of like a calculus or like um, apraxia, like neglect of one of the sides of their body or dementia, something going on with like one of the higher cortices, um, as well as those like symptoms of Parkinsonism. Um, and it's usually like they have su uh, sufficient muscle power, um, just like a lot of difficulty where they're directing those movements. Um, you see this quite cool feature called tactile mitgehen. So if anyone knows the German, um, you can translate that, but um, this is just where like the alien limb, if they do present with that, if the experimenter like or the neurologist or whoever holds um, their hand near the alien limb hand, it will just like actively follow it and the patient will have no um, kind of awareness that this is happening. And yeah, this usually affects patients who are like in the 50 to 70 bracket, um, average duration being about six years before um, obviously like this is going to become a really disabling and life-threatening condition because they are having like this cortical shrinking. Um, yeah, I can't tell you too much generally about like the epidemiology and the survivability of these because they just are that rare. Like if you Google them, you don't really tend to have like much come up at all. If you're looking on like your um, databases like BMJ best practice and stuff like that. But for the sake of exams, they're worth like having a rough idea about. And some other causes of Parkinson's to note. Um, if when later you guys get these slides and stuff like feel free to really go through the tables that are on the right there but i've literally just thrown those in because they were like full of things that i definitely like would never have thought of um to list as causes but with parkinson's you can literally go through like your sort of almost like your surgical sieve and list things that will affect the basal ganglia and therefore cause these symptoms so um quite high up on your list of differentials particularly in a young patient is is wilson's disease that autosomal recessive um disorder that's causing um copper deposits um particularly in oh, that's not where i want to go um in your basal ganglia your liver and in your eyes as those kaiser, kaiser fleischer rings um and obviously like you can reverse those symptoms to some extent with copper chelators but um particularly with older patients the more you damage that area the less reversible it's going to be um don't forget about lewy body dementia which is that sort of dementia presenting with visual hallucinations and some Parkinson's symptoms, um, anti-dopaminergic drugs, a few of which I think might be listed in those. Um, yeah, I can definitely find a list for you somewhere if I've not got one in here already. Um, infarcts to the basal ganglia, so you can still have strokes to the basal ganglia, which could be the underlying cause of your Parkinson's. Um, communicating hydrocephalus can put 
pressure on that area and cause it. You can have psychogenic Parkinson's where there's nothing going wrong at all um, with the brain chemistry um, and the patient is just presenting this way. Um, and encephalopathies can present this way quite a lot as well, particularly if, again, like through like um, whatever like swelling effects um, or like post-infectious damage, they can affect the basal ganglia and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, always worth kind of reading your exam question and just making sure that it's not giving you clues that something else could be the underlying cause. So is it dropping something in there about your patient having like um, asterixis or like a really reduced ceruloplasmin and then you're thinking, is it Wilson's? Are they presenting with these hallucinations? Are you thinking it's Louis body dementia over Parkinson's? Just like, yeah, stuff like that. Don't always just jump to it being Parkinson's. Okay, finally, and then we're going to have some quick questions for you guys. Just wanted to throw in there like hyperkinetic movement disorders. So again, like these we've probably been seen um, years and years going back, but they're still part of the spectrum of movement disorder as well. So you've got the broad categories of having tremor, which like we saw with Parkinson's is a rhythmic sinusoidal oscillation. Core wear is what we describe as like a, a dance-like movement where you've got these excessive irregular movements that might go say like from the shoulder, move down the arm and then like rhythmically move from one part of the body to the other. Myoclonus is those brief shock-like jerks. So you particularly tend to get these just um, physiologically like when we're like really overtired and we're falling asleep um, and we have like a shock response to wake ourselves up. Um, you see them with opioid overdose you see them with primary myoclonus um, and myoclonic epilepsy. Uh, dystonia is where you've got um, sustained muscle spasms. So it's usually that you've got like agonist and, ag and, and antagonist um, are both contracted and it results in these like sort of twisted movements. So patients um, can present with like different types of dystonia. You might get what you call torticollis where it's the neck and it causes them to like jerk the neck backwards or forwards. Um, it could be trismus, which is where they've got like these spasms of the jaw. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of different types of dystonia. And again, that can present for like loads of different reasons. Um, Hemibilismus, which is where you've got these violent swinging movements of one side. And aphetosis, which is probably like the most subtle um, and purposeful seeming ones. Um, yeah, I haven't for some reason put ticks in there, but don't forget about ticks as well, which are like those... Um, stereotypes movements or vocalizations that people can suppress for a while and then they get this like unsustainable urge to like have to let the tick out and it could be a vocal tick or it could be a movement tick obviously like your most famous presentation of that is going to be Tourette's syndrome and another key particularly in the context of Parkinson's disease another key movement disorder to bear in mind is extrapyramidal side effects um, so they themselves can be a cause of Parkinson's type presentation. Um, and extrapyramidal side effects classically occur with neuroleptics. So usually the typical antipsychotics, and that's why we now use atypical antipsychotics. Um, and it tends to be like, this isn't to say that every patient that's going to be on antipsychotics is going to get this. Um, but the risk is with like chronic use of neuroleptics. So the four like key presentations you can get, and I have seen this in a couple of like multi-choice questions before, are acute dystonia, where as I was talking about with dystonia on the previous slide, you tend to just get it in one particular area. So it might be like in the neck, like torticollis. It might be what you call an oculogyric crisis, um, which is yeah, obviously like just where it's affecting the eyes, and you tend to get people with this like upward deviation of the eyes, and like um, they're quite restless and agitated. You might get what you call akathisia. So that's just referring to restlessness, usually presents as like restless legs or pacing um, and patients get this irresistible urge to move. You might present with pseudo Parkinson's. Um, you might get what you call tardive dyskinesia, um, which is probably like the most characteristic presentation where patients get these like writhing facial choreoapatoid movements where they're like sucking the lips, they're sticking the tongue out, the jaws writhing. Um, may sometimes if, like, affect the extremities but it's very often just um localized to the face your management for these is to use a drug called procyclidine 
and you also want to withdraw the neuroleptics because if you, the longer that you keep the patient on them, the more likely it is that these will become irreversible. Um, and yeah, wait a few months because it can take a while for these effects to like to just wear off as well. Um, just as a last disease, I quickly wanted to talk about Huntington's because I don't know, I can't think from after second year where it actually like ever came in to teaching, but obviously it's, it's still relevant to finals and stuff. It definitely has still come up. So um, in case you've not touched it anywhere else, um, Huntington's, Huntington's disease is obviously an autosomal dominant trinucleotide um, expansion repeat of your CAG gene on chromosome four, which results in what you call the defective Huntington gene. Um, I couldn't actually tell you what the Huntington gene does, but it does because of this mutation, you then get degeneration of your cholinergic and gabaminergic neurons in the striatum, um, which as being like, if you know, like GABA is one of your key um, inhibitory neurotransmitters, it's obviously going to lead to like a picture of um, hyperkinesis. Um, so you get this chorea, you get personality changes, particularly like those, what you might consider like frontal lobe personality changes, like irritability, depression, apathy, um, associated intellectual impairment, um, other kind of um, issues with movement, like abnormal eye movements and dystonia. And you tend to find that because this only affects patients, it's usually like patients like 40 and onwards, and it demonstrates genetic anticipation and it will affect everybody that is a carrier. It's got complete penetrance. So you may find that unfortunately, um, patients presenting with this will um, find out they've got it too late after they've already passed it on to someone else. Um, yeah, but it will get worse with each generation. So you can get de novo examples of it where patients are quite mild, but if they continue to pass it on, it will get worse with each generation. So like genetic counseling is quite important with this and it generally causes death after about 20 years. We don't have, um, we don't have a treatment um, to cure it, but you can treat some of the symptoms like chorea with risperidone or and you can give other symptomatic treatment like anticholinergics and things like that. Um, Anti-muscarinics even, um, so this is like some of your other symptoms and obviously like offer supportive care. Cool, so if you guys can do the poly thing for me like you did last week, got a quick quiz for you. Uh, we'll see how that goes. If anyone's got any questions as well, like feel free to like ask them now. It's quite nice when you guys ask questions as you go, because um, obviously like it's quite easy to forget them part way through and stuff. Do you guys need the link again or are we okay? Right, I'll see if I can get this to work. That was from last week's. Again, like these might not per se be like things we've been talking about today but there's a few things that I'm just going to assume that like you're quite tipped upon so where tremors are concerned um they usually quite like to throw um a central tremor into the mix so that's going to be your younger patient who's presenting with a bilateral shake um that as opposed to being a resting tremor might be more of an intention tremor and it's going to get worse with stress and emotion and improve when they've rested or they've had a drink it's probably going to be autosomal dominant it could be passed down through the family um, and the way that we have first line of treating it is propanolol. There's not really much um, basis for treating it with other kinds of therapy. Okay, if this doesn't work, then I'll try and post it as a thing at a separate time. Okay. Right, we might not be able to do the quiz then. Um, I'll tell you what, if that's not going to work, I'm sorry, I did want to have a little bit more participation than this, but um, I'll try and post it as a thing for you guys to do afterwards. Try one more time, okay. Nah, I don't think we're gonna get that to work. Right, I'll try and make a quiz for you guys to do some other time um, because I think the quiz worked quite well last week for anyone who came to um, the palliative session. 
Um, yeah, we'll try and make that up for you as a quiz instead. Um, sorry about that, guys. I don't know why that's not working. Um, if anyone's got any questions, please do post away. Um, I have got the feedback form as well for this week. It would be great if you could let me know like, what other neuro stuff you want. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are finding these useful because sometimes you sort of, I'm going to pause the recording there actually. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, yeah, you sort of sit here at the screens like talking to yourself, wondering if it's going down well. Um, and it's a lot easier when. I'm quite used to speaking in front of groups of people. It's really weird just talking at a computer. So hopefully, like, I don't come across as a complete nonce to you. Um, if you've got specific bits of neuro or anything else, to be fair, that you want to do, like, again, let us know because we are at your disposal. Sorry that the quiz didn't work. The intention was there for it to work, but for whatever reason, my internet isn't having any of it. Um, but I'll get it available to you. If anyone's got any questions, I will pause that one there. Thank you for watching, guys.